It's cruises. It's cruises. It's cruises. It's cruises. Right in. Equitable London treaties. Now, I'm sure there's going to be someone already asking a question. But is this history? Well, it is another form of learning from history, and I'm a lecturer. And I'm firmly of the belief that you have to teach the lessons of history. Now, the lessons of history can be drawn in very different ways. And sometimes we understand best what the lessons are from the history which did happen, happen by considering what the potential lessons will be from the history which didn't happen. Now, all these treaties, all this stuff, is grounded as much as I can in reality. I, I have tried to keep it as close to the real history as possible. I've had to change some things to make it work. Honestly, you had to change less to make the Washington Treaty equitable. But if you're starting this from the basis that the Washington Treaty happened as is, you've already got a precedent of a treaty which was inequitable and, frankly, was more the sort of treaty you would expect to be imposed by a victor on a loser after a major war rather than a treaty between friends. Theoretically friends. And theoretically friends who are the winning side in the war. So that is an interesting time to get into. With that said, we finally got to cruisers. And of course in the Washington Treaty, as I discussed, the limitations for crew for ships, any ships which weren't capital ships or carriers. And it shows you how much politics is involved was basically 10,000 tons and nothing, no gun bigger than 8.1 inch or 8 inch. It's interesting, to say the least. The amount of politics that goes on, and honestly, I would consider in many ways the London Treaty to be, in many ways, the most well informed of the treaties. It is. It, it, it does include some areas in it which, frankly, do make a lot of sense, and there's a lot of things included which were not included in previous versions of the treaties. But in this case, it is included. You know, the the, London, the Washington Treaty is supposedly about stopping an arms race and stopping this, that, other. No, it's about, it's about saving money. And it's about trying to avoid having to spend money. You'll spend the money if you have to, especially in the case of Britain. But America doesn't want to spend the money, and Britain's just going, hmm. And in many ways, America is also so fixated on the idea of making Japan not be a threat. And that's far more of a thing they worry about than Britain. That they are pushing Japan down hard and they're happy to put in rules which don't make sense. We've been over this before in the Washington Treaty series. The fact that on no sane ground does 35,000 tons make sense for your capital ship. Not if you care about your sailors. Because you know, looking around, that you're looking at 42,000 tons, roughly for HMS Hood. That's the most recent ship. Honestly, if you're using the honest precedent, the honest precedent of the cruisers, used to set up the limits in the cruiser part of the Washington Treaty, you should have been probably looking at 45,000 tons. For your capital ship. And that's before we get into carriers. Well, the Washington ships, uh, a Washington series is all out now. That's been out. So I hope you've enjoyed that. And I hope you found it interesting. And now, of course, we're into the London treaties. And this is the 8th of June. This is cruises. Now, what am I doing on the 8th of June? Oof. Who knows what I'm doing? Who knows? It's a it's a fun thing, but 
if you're watching this, where am I going to be on the 9th of June is probably more of an interesting question because if you're watching this and you're in Canada and you want to come say hello to us, well, 9th of June, we are 8th of June, we've been at Sackville. Hello. And 9th, probably at Sackville when this comes out. And 9th of June, we go to the Museum of the Atlantic, which is going to be fun. And we fly back to Hamilton. So that's going to be cool. Now, today, therefore, we're talking about cruises. So here is an example of some of the cruises around at this point. HMS Calypso, 4,180 tons in standard. Why have I got this one here? Because this is your light cruiser at the time. Yes, we're all going to focus in on the heavy cruisers. We're all going to talk about the heavy cruisers. But what you have to remember is Britain goes to the Washington Treaty and to the London Treaty with a very firm requirement. They need enough tonnage to build 70 cruisers. Why does Britain want 70 cruisers? Why do they want 70 cruisers? Well, it comes down to a very simple fact. The British have looked at the global trading network they're responsible for. They've looked at their empire. They've looked at their commonwealth. And they've gone, oh, sugar. Really? Oh, sugar? Yes, oh, sugar. Uh, we're going to need a lot of presence around the world to actually be able to secure this stuff. Oh. There is a problem, though. Calypso is 4,180 tons. Calypso is the pride of World War I light cruiser technology and light cruiser thinking. She's gorgeous. She's also horrendously out of date. Let's be honest, most of the C-class cruisers that are still in service in World War II get converted to AA cruisers. Armed with a lot of four inch guns and radar. That's because they really can't do the cruiser roll anymore. No one wants them anywhere near the cruiser roll anymore. Now, again, the Royal Navy was thinking they could use some overage cruisers, and this is one of the things which comes in with the overage requirement in that ships which are overage can be kept to an extent. But there are limitations on how many you can keep over age, and there's limitations on how useful they are and how much you can upgrade them. So you've got to be quite careful with what you're doing. Now, you can of course come back to me and go, but Alex, there wasn't a limitation even under the original Washington Treaty. You said it was equitable in itself. They could have built as much as they wanted, as many as they wanted in that period from 1922 to 1930. And my response would be, yes, but once again, we are dealing with British governments. And once again, they ain't always the smartest thing in the world. Which sounds terrible to say, but it's true. They're not. They are constantly looking at what are the other options for them to do, and what are the other options for them to spend the money on, and what are they... You know, no one wants to spend money if you don't have to. Even on the fence, no one wants to spend money if you don't have to. No government wants to put up the taxes more than it wants to. And the British governments at the time are prioritising, as is traditional for British governments, the British economy. And the British economy is considered better when it's low tax, uh, when the taxes are as low as they can be. That doesn't mean they're always low. <laughs> I do find it funny when people go, we're in this, you know, the taxes are super high, and you go, Borrowing is also super high. And people go, yes. And I go, what's the scenario going on at the moment? And if you're in the middle of a world war, mm -hmm. if you're in a global natural disaster, probably going to be the case as well, because the government's probably going to be having to spend a lot of money and tax revenues are going to be as low as anything. So they're going to put up the taxes. Now, here you go. Here's the outline of what we're going to be doing. This is going to be a fun trip. It is. I'm slightly sad to think that when this comes out, 
I'll be more than halfway through. More than halfway through. But it's going to be fun. So, why have I combined the London Treaties into one? This is mostly because the second London Treaty depresses me. No, serious reason. Um, the 1936 Treaty is signed by USA, UK, also on behalf of Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and India, so it's basically British Commonwealth, um, and France. So, to my view, it doesn't actually count. The reason I can say it doesn't actually count is because it would be like, and I've used this uh, uh, this analogy before, that, well, I've used a NATO analogy before, so um, let's put it this way. It would be, it's kind of like during the, the Second Napoleon, the Napoleonic Wars, all the powers in the coalition fighting against Napoleon you know, actually declaring and deciding that they would not use first rates. Well, they were going to limit the number of third rates they could have. Napoleon can build whatever he likes. It doesn't count. A treaty signed in 1936, which is completely discarded, uh, which is not even really in force, and in 1937 they all go, ah, none of the dictatorships are actually following what they're supposed to be doing. Ah! We're going to lose. Ah, we need to actually split some money. Yeah, so yeah, the nineteen thirty six treaty doesn't really count. However, it does show intent. Which is useful for context and some analysis. So I've included it. But honestly, this is mostly focused around what would be an equitable version of the nineteen thirty London Treaty. And then I have to be rather careful of my own biases, because my own bias is looking at it and going, well, even a slightly larger force structure being enabled can have a massive repercussions. Now, I'm going to get into this. There is one that she's going to come up, which is called Sloops and Other Ships. And that one, I am going to give you a heads up now when it comes out, is going to be quite high on the ranting scale, probably. I do apologise in advance. But there is a lot in there which should have been done, which governments could have done and they didn't do, which could have helped out with a lot of the areas we're going to be talking about. But with cruisers, there are especially issues which could have been sorted out. But these are affected by treaty. And so I'll get into it. Also, the 1936 treaty includes this lovely idea that no cruiser should have standard tonnage greater than 8,000 tons. You know, it's been 10,000 tons for years. Now we're making it down to 8,000 tons. So don't go, who's trying to put this in? Is it the British? Because they just don't want other people to have destroy uh, cruisers that are not much bigger than them? Because they have to build 70? Yeah. So, context of the changes to the treaties. Well, the Washington Treaty is left as written, as been said. And I have to start doing a bit of changing of history, because I'm not going to get rid of the Wall Street crash. However, I am going to go for more Keynesian economics policy. I've said this all before, but I'll say it again. So, I've had to make a couple of changes in government. Now, Stanley Baldwin, instead this time, wins the election in 1929, not Ramsey MacDonald. Now, there isn't really a massive change in terms of policy, and in fact, if you want a period where the two parties are saying things in different ways, but ultimately they're delivering pretty much exactly the same thing, you have a look at the 1920s and 1930s and the Conservative and Labour Party. Now, the, really, the reason I've gone for them is because the Conservatives are just about keen enough on the larger... County class cruisers and just enough about enough keen enough to go on the more Keynesian and defence policy that they might they will spend slightly more. So it's slightly more believable than doing some things which are going to be done in this treaty. I then had to look at the the US and um, 
Yeah, Hoover or Smith? Frankly, anyone would be better than Hoover. So, I gave Smith a go. And that's it. So, let's begin. Now, this, of course, is an E-Class Light Cruiser. Wrong. It's the vessels which became the basis for the heavy cruiser designation. Yeah, I know. There are some people look at, look at the picture and when I just put it up and go, well, there's Effingham there, so it must be an E-Class. I go, nope. It's one of the heavy cruisers. Now, these, of course, had 7.5-inch guns, hence 8-inch gun as the, as, as the limit. And there were 9,750 tons in standard. <laughs> hence 10,000 tons as the limit. And could do the speed of 30 knots. So not exactly slow, but look at what they're called up there, light cruisers. These were not supposed to be heavy cruisers. That's not what they were intended for, not what they were designed for, but this is what they became the limitation for heavy cruisers. This is what it became in this period. Because it is the 1930s treaties which create the heavy cruiser and the light cruiser. Up until this point, there had just been cruisers. You might build a lighter one. You might build a heavier one. You might build one with 8-inch guns. You might build one with 6-inch guns. It didn't really matter. But I would say that a large number of this stuff and the treaty stuff in here to do with light cruisers is because of the British being incredibly worried that they're going to have to end up facing people who have fleets entirely of heavy cruisers. They won't have as many ships as the British do. But the British can't afford to build to match all those heavy cruisers whilst also producing enough cruisers to do all the jobs they need to do. Which is where the light cruiser comes in. It's fun times. So this is what the treaty says. High contracting parties agreed not to exercise their rights to lay down the keels of capital ship replacement tonnage during the years 1931 to 36. Emphasis on the capital ship. Now, this might be the most stupid thing you could ever do, but we'll leave that to one side, because this means that, well, if you're not building up your production or your industry, other people aren't either. It's kind of like making a willful decision to do the stupidity that was, we will build HMS Dreadnought, then we will let, uh, we, then we will not build any more until we let everyone else start building theirs, and then we will do a crash building program. It just don't work. And what is this going to come down to? Well, it's a vessel's exceeding 3,000 tonnes. Any cruiser which exceeds 3,000 tonnes, if laid down before 1st of January 1920, it's, gonna, it's got a 16-year life. If laid down after the 31st of December 1919, it's got a 20-year life. So the Royal Navy has a load of C-class cruisers, E-class cruisers, and the Hawkins class, which all theoretically have a maximum age limit of 16 years, which is good. But it also has some counties which have a maximum age of 20 years, which is slightly more complicated to deal with. But not that complicated when you consider that most of them were built in the 1920s, which means they're mostly supposed to be gone in the 1940s. Woohoo! Which also, if you once you start thinking of that as a reality, does explain some of the decisions made. Main text. Well, the naval combatant vessels of the United States, the British Commonwealth of Nations, and Japan, other than capital ships, aircraft carriers, and all vessels exempt from limitation under the Ar Article 8 shall be limited during the term of the present treaty as provided in this part 3, and in the case of special vessels as provided in Article 12. It's always nice when you read that. You go, oh, this is going to be fun. This is going to get prescriptive, isn't it? And it does. Here is the prescription for cruisers. For the purpose of this part three, the definition of cruisers destroy and destroyer categories shall be as follows. Cruisers, surface vessels of war other than capital ships or aircraft carriers, the standard displacement of which exceeds 1,850 tons, that's 1,880 metric tons, or with a gun above 5.1 inches caliber, 
The cruiser category is divided into two subcategories as follows. Cruisers carrying a gun above 6.1 inches. And cruisers carrying a gun not above 6.1 inches. This is copied directly from the treaty, which is why it's got inch spelt out I-N-C-H rather than, as I usually do it, which is I-N. Article 16. The completed tonnage in the cruiser, destroyer, and submarine categories, which is not to be exceeded on the 31st of December 1936, is given in the following table. Cruisers with guns more than 6.1 inch. USA, 180,000 tons. The British Commonwealth, 146,800 tons. Which one decided that? And Japan, 108,400 tons. This is sounding like a variable to, a veritable fare. With guns of 6.1 inch caliber or less. USA, 143,500 tons. Woo! British Commonwealth, 192,200 tons. Hellza. And Japan, 100,450 tons. Now, I know we haven't got through it all, and I have got this on a timing because, well, it makes sense to have it on some time control. The vessels which cause the tonnage in any category to exceed the figures given in the foregoing table shall be disposed of gradually during the period ending on the 31st of December 1936. The maximum number of cruisers, subcategory A, shall be as follows. For the United States, they are allowed 18, so they're allowed 18 10,000 ton ships. The British Commonwealth Nations, 15. So, well, let's see. That's uh, that's 15 ships, but uh, they're, they're not allowed 10,000 tons for each ship. They're allowed, oh, they've got 3,200 tons taken off. So they're what, allowed roughly, I don't know, 9,800, a little bit less than 9,800 tons for, per ship? That doesn't really seem fair, does it? And Japan, 12. Well, they've got a hundred thousand four hundred fifty. That's quite that that that's rude. So the, the the Japanese are allowed twelve ships, but they're going to be what eight eight thousand tons each. Um, I, I'd feel a bit peed off if I peed off if I was a Japanese. I must say, a, a bit annoyed, definitely. Um, not more than twenty five percent of the allowed total tonnage in the cruiser category may be fitted with a landing on platform or deck for air, uh, aircraft. Tonnage of any vessels are retained under Article 13 or disposed of in accordance with Article 2, Annex 2 to Part 2 of the Subject Treaty shall be included in subject, the tonnage subject to its limitation. Those basically refer to things which are being used as targets, training ships, or other such sundry duties. Article 17, a transfer not exceeding 10% of the allowed total tonnage of the category or subcategory into which the transfer is to be made shall be permitted between the cruisers of subcategory B and destroyers. Now, by the way, you're allowed to transfer tonnage from B, that is, light cruisers, to destroyers. Not from destroyers to light cruisers. Article 18. The United States contemplates the, uh, the completion by 1935 of 15 cruisers of subcategory A on an aggregate tonnage of 150,000 tons. Uh, for each of the three remaining cruisers of the subcategory A, which is entitled to construct, the United States may elect to substitute 15,166 tons of cruisers of subcategory B. In case the United States shall construct or more, or one or more of such uh, uh, three remaining cruisers of subcategory A, the 16th unit will not be laid down before 1933 and will not be completed before 1936. The 17th will not be laid down before 1934. Four and will not be completed before 1937. The 18th will not be laid down before 1935 and will not be completed before 1938. Oh my lord. I have oh so much pain. Article 19. Except as provided in Article 20, the tonnage laid down in any category subject to limitation uh, accordance with Article 16 shall not exceed the amount necessary to reach the maximum allowed tonnage of the category. Or to replace of vessels that become overage before the 31st of December 1936. Nevertheless, replacement tonnage may be laid down for cruisers and submarines that become overage in 1937, 38, and 39, and for destroyers that become overage in 37 and 38. Article 20. Notwithstanding the rules for replacement contained in next I to Part 2, the Frobisher and Effingham, United Kingdom, may be disposed of during the year 1936, apart from the cruisers under construction. 
Thus, April 1930, the total replacement tonnage of cruisers to be completed in the case of the British Commonwealth and nations prior to 31st December 1936 shall not exceed 91,000 tons. Japan may replace Tama by new construction to be completed during the year 1936. Yes. Yes. We do have a lot of fun with us. But now we're into the Sendai class, which are, of course, the Japanese cruisers. And let's think about what that treaty has just said. Well, it's a problem for Japan that this is also the level of cruiser they have at this point. The cruisers you see going around are a mixture of ones which would not have looked out of place in 1914, if not even 1913, and other vessels which look, frankly, like they're from halfway into World War II. You're dealing with a period of transition, and on a period of technological transition, development, and evolution, being forced in many ways by a changing appreciation of the realities of a global war, but also differing military cultures, differing national cultures, different, differing perspectives on what a war is and how you fight it, and the development of naval, aviation, naval, and land-based, means that you have basically created a scenario right for people to feel like they have to cheat. And that treaty, let's be honest, if we go back to it, this treaty, this text, there are numerous points in it which will inspire treachery. And I'm not talking of the Blatant, oh, we're going to build a massive ship and say, claim it's underneath the, 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 the treaty limits kind. No, I'm talking of the subtle kind of creative accounting going into the ship designs. Even in America and Britain. The good example, and we'll be looking at this when we look at destroyers, is that destroyers can all be designed a lot lighter. It's amazing how quickly, how quickly, the destroyer designs all leak to roughly 2,000 tons in standard when you give a, when the treaty has been given up on, when they are working to prepare and when war begins. That's what they leap to, the big destroyers. They leap to roughly 2,000 tons in standard. From theoretically 1,500 tons in standard. Cruisers also leak. We all know the county class suddenly amazingly look like they sit right in the water. And uh, they've had me, suddenly got a four inch armor belt. And these are the treaties which make that happen. Now, and I will add this because I've already received some questions about it in the past on other treaties papers, I am not going to rewrite the treaty text for text, point for point. That would take a lot of time. And the more I try and rewrite the minutiae of the text, the more I open it up for my implicit biases and my hindsight to interfere. In the phraseology and the terminology I do select, which is why I try and keep my equitable treaties to a level of genericism. Because actually, by dealing with it at that scale, I limit down on what I can muck around with. <laughs> But still, she's a cool looking ship. She just not really what you expect to be a frontline cruiser for the Japanese at this point. Good shit though. Nineteen thirty six. 
Light vessels, uh, surface vessels, are now divided into three categories because they're all light, which is thankful. I finally realized it. You have got vessels which carry a gun with a caliber exceeding 6.1 inch. They're one category of light surface vessel. Vessels which do not carry a gun which with a caliber exceeding 6.1 inch. And the sand displacement of which exceeds 3,000 tons. And vessels which do not carry a gun with a caliber exceeding 6.1 inch. And the standard displacement of which does not exceed 3,000 tons. So I'm presuming that's heavy cruisers, light cruisers, and destroyers, and pretty much everything else designed as such. Um, however, we will notice that the light surface vessels of certain categories A and B are both 16 and 20 years reaffirmed, and light surface vessels subcategory C have changed to our 16 years. Okay. This is where it gets weird. No light surface vessel of subcategory B exceeding 8,000 tons, standard displacement, and no light surface vessel of subcategory A shall be laid down or acquired prior to the 1st of January 1943. This is in 1936. Japan has already announced that they intend to leave the Naval Treaty as of 1937. The wonderful, wonderful Europeans are having interesting things going on in Spain with a minor thing called the Civil War. Uh, we have the Soviet Union and the Finns squaring off at each other. We have the Japanese doing stuff, Nazi stuff in China. We have the Italians doing various nasty things in Africa. We have the Italians, of course, are now fascisti. Spain will soon be going fascisti. Germany is also gone fascisti. Um, all that's going on in the world and the politicians are going you know what? what's going to make this world a better place if all the people who look like they're going to be on our side in the forthcoming fight limit themselves and their cruisers by 2,000 tons more than we've previously been limiting them when the other sides are no longer applying any limits. This will show the moral leadership and courage needed to forge peace. No, it won't. It won't. Civi passam parabellum. Those who seek peace should prepare for war. You want to deter a conflict, you deter a conflict by strength. There is a whole lot of stuff being made these days about the deterrence by denial. Well, you go, well, how do you deny movement? Well, a submarine denies movement by sinking the enemy, any, any enemy ship that goes into its area. So does a minefield. How do you deny movement with a surface ship, which is a rules engagement of a piece? Are you denying dominance? In which case you need to turn up with more ships in the first place. In which case, that's deterrence by strength. It. This goes. These ideas go around every few decades, okay? And every few decades, you have the same people coming out and going, We can do this. We can bring about peace if we only set the example and disarm. I suppose there are the same those are the same people who in horror movies tend to be the people who walk alone into the darkness going if I don't believe there is Jason or whatever out to kill me I won't die There's got to be some realistic cause for those people to exist in movies it can't be just entirely a trope of media concoction but This is what you have going on. 
They want peace. And again, you return to, well, the traditional thinking. The traditional thinking is that in this period it's affecting Europeans and to extent America, but mainly Europeans are talking about France and Britain. And to an extent, the British elements of the wider world, the Commonwealth, the Dominions, etc., is the horror of World War One, the legacy of World War One, the legacy of millions of their men, of their people, citizens dying in that war. Most importantly, as I've discussed in other videos, the fact is that the two groups who suffer most in terms of percentages of deaths and likelihood to die are corporals and sub-lieutenants and lieutenants, junior officers and junior NCOs. Why? Because they're the ones who lead from the front, who are usually at the front. And usually the senior officer is having to take charge and cannot afford to expose themselves in the same way. They will still be leading from the front, but they won't necessarily be the one who jumps through a door first, or the one who puts their head over the parapet to look first, or the one who decides to do the really stupid thing first, because they've had just enough experience, they will think of another way of doing it, whereas the junior officer and the junior NCO usually has the right mix of responsibility, image of what they're supposed to do, and experience slash inexperience, enough experience to know what needs to be done, but inexperience to think of, hang on, is there a different way of doing this than the necessarily the obvious one? You get exceptions to these, but that's really what sort of is for all. So, they had lost entire generations, entire family names and lines had been wiped out in Passchendaele, Somme, and all those other battles. Even at Jutland. Entire ships, crews, taken. As such, you have a generation who have seen their friends, their families coping with this trauma, and they put their own trauma onto the rest of the world. They project. They presume everyone else must have the same horror of war as them. Therefore, they think if they show they are not after war, the other side, who's just as horrified of war as they are, will respond with, oh, they don't want a war. Well, we don't want a war, so we'll both disarm and it'll be, ha it'll be peaceful. It's one of those times where I love the spirit. I want to root for them. But me as a historian, doesn't think it works that way. And of course, if we look through history, it doesn't work through that way. Neither does it work through relying on others to be armed on your behalf. Alliances are as strong in many respects as the weakest member. They're not made up. The, the strongest member is not the sole point of alliance. They are as strong as the weakest member. Because the weakest member becomes the spot which the enemy can focus on. And strength can be more than just numbers of troops under arms. It can be a lot more, and is a lot more. So what do we do? Well, for starters, we could adjust the equitable ratio. Um, that is, I, I'm, there isn't really a ratio being put forward. You know, look at those tonnage limitations. I'll be getting this. There is not a ratio. 
there is a lot of weirdness going on. And if you're going to be sort of building, well, building is an economic boost for the UK and USA. Yes, you have two options after a big crash. You can invest in the military and you can invest in infrastructure. If you invest in both, that usually helps your economy most of all. Also do some house building. That's usually fairly good. And public works such as building hospitals, schools, all good. Railway lines, lovely. Roads, as I said, infrastructure, ports, upgrading, all those things. Using the fact that you've got a lot of cheap labor around because people are out of jobs to get a lot of good stuff done for your economy to provide more employment and boost employment as the economy grows, that's usually a very smart decision to make. Now, again, this is the point where usually people go, Alex, but you were a Conservative Borough Councillor, surely you may leave in small government. No, I believe in having the right side of government for the situation. And traditionally, Conservatives have been some of the, despite Conservatives claiming to be laser fair, and they are, when it comes to recessions in infrastructure construction, public works, and defence. Because if you provide employment through those, you benefit the country as a whole, you benefit it when it's out of recession, and you tend to soften the recession landing and therefore provide a better bounce. If you're smart about it. And by the way, that's very conservative to go with not an ideology, but to go with the actual facts. That's what conservatives were built to do after all. They were actually to liberalism. The idea was you shouldn't govern in ideology, you should govern in reality. If you can find any political party these days which follows that, I'll be surprised. Uh, reinforcement for the Treaty Party in Japan. If you can provide some construction, it that will help that way. And stronger position for France and UK. Posture for when dealing with Mussolini and Hitler. Again. They feel strong because they're arming and the others aren't. If the others were arming from 1930, it'd be a case of, yeah, you want to build up? You're, you're going to get anywhere near us anytime soon? No? Okay. Go have fun. And also, if you think about it, if you have accelerated, if you consider the cycles of procurement and the cycles of development, if you start increasing your procurement in 1930 and the scalability of it, it will mean actually your ability to produce even more grows. So you have to start considering, okay, Britain starts, Britain and America start their really their investment and growth at about 1937. Trouble is for Britain, war starts in 1939. For America, war starts in 1941. But if you take back it to 1930 and you start to have an increase from about 1931 onwards, then Britain, even if war starts at the same point, has now had eight years. To develop and grow. It, uh, I'm not saying it goes straight to a war emergency build and is bankrupting the country to build as much as it can, but I'm telling you, it, it's saying it escalates its construction. That provides you a far firm base to grow from. Same with the USA. They'd suddenly be twelve. They, they'd suddenly be ten years away. Just think of how much stronger they could be. And if you do go to that point, at what point does it Japan realize that they cannot? Or if they're constructing, they're too busy constructing, going, well, we can't go now because we haven't ready, we haven't finished construction yet. We can't go now because we haven't finished construction yet. And again, this is the thing. If you want to head off super weapons, which are built in secret, like Yamato and those ships, you allow them to build ships in public. If you don't want your enemy to build secret weapons, which could be absolutely devastating, you make sure they can construct weapons. But be honest about it. That's a sensible thing to do. Secret weapons will tend to be problematic for you to deal with. Thankfully, due to Japan's maritime infrastructure and the inability to build more than two, they weren't. Stronger position for France and UK, I said, dealing with Mussolini and Hitler. Whilst our options were discussed in the Capital Ship Partner series, it's... I'm not going to go further than that. And you might notice some slides turn up the same in each one of these videos, and there's a reason is because I'm restating that, because I need to, because some people are going to be watching one of these videos for the first time, and they're going to go, how long have you skipped all that? 
I know this because in one of the videos for the Washington Treaty series, I did skip it and didn't have it. If you go to that video, you can probably work out which one, you'll find comments below. You also find comments dated to that period to Twitter. You'll find comments to that period dated to various other forms of social media. All of them certainly asked me why I hadn't included it. What I, I, I hadn't skipped to the point. I hadn't explained myself. So now they're in every single one. So this was the Washington Treaty of a ship's limitation. Individual limit 10,000 tons standard. Gun caliber limit 8 inch. These things didn't happen. British ratio 450,000 tons to 300,000 tons, 250,000 tons. And this was for cruisers. Ah, oh, Miyoko. 11,633 tons in standard. <clears throat> Combination of Japan not feeling they can build enough ships and not feeling they have enough tonnage. Remember, Japan are wanted a 7 to 10 ratio. Why do they want a 7 to 10 ratio? Because they judge that would be just enough to deny either America or Britain an easy victory in steamrolling them. They didn't think they could win. They didn't think they could win a war versus even. They just felt that that would stop them being able to be steamrolled. If they have that, and they have their security of their 7 to 10, 7 to 10 ratio, they might still stray, but the risk versus reward starts to change. Because under the scenario you set up, they know they can't defend themselves because they don't have enough ships. So the ships they build, because they know they can't build enough ships, have to be powerful enough to make up that difference. Whereas if they can build enough ships... Then is it worthwhile risking potential conflict or other issues by breaking those rules? Arms treaties, etc., are only held to by nations who believe they benefit them. You make a treaty which doesn't benefit one of the members in that treaty, they won't hold to it. They need to have the feeling that being in that treaty benefits them. And the, ultimately, you can argue that the Washington Treaty and London Treaty do benefit Japan. Because with the maritime infrastructure at the disposal of Britain, let alone America once it starts building up, they could easily build up and overwhelm Japan and its limited industry and its limited infrastructure because of its, similar, its issues with its geography and its population they could easily do that. So 7 to 10 would have been their safety net. But if they know they're not secure under the ratio, because they have got the 5 free ratio, they haven't even really got that in some regards, then why should they? What is the benefit for them? What is the benefit of them staying in the treaty? The only benefit is it limits American and British construction, which is only of a benefit as long as the American and British construction, even limited by treaty, is not enough to wipe them out in a single go in a single blow. And for that, they reckon you needed ten to seven, a little bit more than five to three, not much more, but a little bit more. And the Equitable Treaty, Washington Treaty proposal, well, 10,000 tons. It makes sense. It keeps with history. But um, thanks to uh, Churchill. Is it right? No. Is it, is it really sensible? No. But it will produce you a decent sized light cruiser. This is why in World War II, I, I often put forward the argument that you have light cruisers 
and you have scout cruisers. You do not have heavy and light cruisers. Because there is no true heavy cruiser until the Alaska class appears. Please do not bring up the Deutschland class to me, because whilst they are an 11-inch armed cruiser, they are in no way, shape or form, what you should actually be building if you're building an actual heavy cruiser for the period. USS Marblehead. 7,163 tons of... We had good ideas, and then we built this. Which has got those good ideas in, but in such a way that it looks positively composed. It happens. To the best of us, I'm told. To the best. So, that's what the long treaties boil down to. Ships laid down prior to 1920s, replaced after 16, uh, at 16 years, after at 20 years. Anything exceeding 1,850 tons with guns above 5.1 inch, but less than 10,000 tons with guns below 8 inch, is broadly speaking a cruiser. Cruisers were divided into two groups, depending on guns below 6.1 inch or above. The US gets allocated a total of 323,500 tons, but you do have to remember that they can modify that a little bit to give themselves more light cruisers, should they wish, by not building three heavy cruisers, should they wish. British Commonwealth gets 339,000 tons of cruisers. So yeah, as you can see, the British theoretically get... Hmm... About five and a half thousand tons more of cruisers, which is what an air refuser class. Uh, Japan gets a hundred eight for a thousand four hundred tons and hundred thousand four hundred fifty tons for a total of two hundred eight thousand eight hundred fifty tons worth of cruisers. Now I did some ratio maths, and the total ratio uh, comes out to roughly 37, 39, 24. Which is quite interesting to try and work out, because you start to go, okay, right then, what's this going to be? Let's try and get this into single digits. And, well, that becomes... 9.25 to 9.75 versus 6. Now, you can say there's a 5-3 ratio going on, and you can say, actually, the Japanese have managed to get above the 5-3 ratio. Which they have, broadly speaking. But oh goodness me, is that a complicated way of going about it. And although in theory, in this form, the maximum for the United States is 18, Japan, uh, British Commonwealth 15, Japan 12. Those are the difficulties as said. And uh, no vessels greater than 8,000 tons were laid down acquired prior to the first generation of British Free. free. That's the only thing from the 1936 treaty in this particular section I want to see anywhere near here. I don't know. And then there's this beauty, which is floating around a lot at 10,400 tons in standard. Technically concluded in the course of the British Commonwealth allowance. 10,400 tons. Eight eight-inch guns, plus a fairly large number of four-inch guns and torpedoes, and a plane. <sighs> what can I say? The world is what it is. 
So what would be an equitable London Treaty? Well, that's bordering is on somewhere in the region of 5.3 something is going on. Because it's 9.75. Six. Which is just below five to three, really. So, honestly, I think a 10, 10, 7, 4, 4 ratio is fine. And for starters, that would make the math so much easier. And that is ultimately what I want to do. Again, if you want to make a treaty easy to follow and incentivize it following, you have to make it easy. Complexity leads to dispute. Com dispute leads to disenchantment, disengagement, and can lead to dis and distrust. All of which means that you end up cheating before the other side cheats before you, uh, cheats on you. So, yeah, eight inch guns have been a maximum gun. I'd love to increase the gun. I'd love to just. Uh, this is the thing. This is why I'm being. trying to be as generic as possible. Because if I get in this, I would honestly be sitting there going, well, no, you should have a, uh, a heavy cruiser level of roughly. Ooh, well, what makes sense in this period? I go roughly 15,000 tons and or 60 actually I'd go 16,000 tons for heavy cruisers and a 9. Point, nine and a half inch gun being the maximum they could build. Yeah, or a 10 inch gun. I'll make it a 10 inch gun just to cause everyone trouble because 10 inch is a terrible weapon to use. So everyone will end up going with the nines and sort of going hmm. 10 inches the holy grail if we can make it work properly. Yeah. <laughs> it's just that the Nadia spot of being just about heavy enough to require capital ship level support, but just about small enough it doesn't give you capital ship levels of damage. <laughs> yeah, but that's me. That's not what they would do in this case. That's not reality. So leave it at the 8 inch. Leave it about in divisions. And leave it to the limit for individual ship tonnage remains at 10,000 tons. Total tonnage. Well, okay, so if I'm going to work it out on a 10 10 7, 7, uh, 7 4, 4 ratio, which would I prefer to use? 192,200 tons or 180,000 tons? Well, the 180,000 tons sounds fine at the first point, and it is. It's 18,000 tons. Divided by 10, that's, each unit is 18,000 tons. But the trouble is, that's not two ships. And then when we get to the f Japanese, well, 7 times 18. Okay, well, that's going to be, and I kid you not, that's going to be 70,000 tons. Plus 56,000 tons, which is 126,000 tons. And you go, well, you're allowed 126,000 tons worth of 10 heavy cruisers, which are supposed to be actually 10,000 tons each. So you can build 12, but I, yeah, you know, it's just, it's, no. <sighs> And then, of course, we get to the um, French and Italians, who, of course, aren't actually part, really, of the Cruiser Treaty, but do actually fit according to its status anyway, so I included them in this thing as well. Because they just get four times 18,000 tons, which would be 72,000 tons. So I upped it. By a tremendous amount? No. By two hundred thousand up to two hundred thousand tons, which yes is twenty thousand tons on the heavy cruiser limit for the Americans, which I can see there being many U.S. admirals crying into their milk over. Oh my, we're allowed twenty thousand tons more of heavy cruisers. We'll be so distraught. It's going to bankrupt us. 
And the Royal Navy has got 200,000 tons worth of light cruisers. Admittedly, so does the US Navy now, but that's not really going to need it here, not there. They both have 20,000 tons. They both be going. Mm hmm. Now, here is an interesting thing. Do you put in the limitations? So the maximum they can have is 20 each for the US and Commonwealth, 14 for Japan, and 8 for France and Italy. It's tempting. I'd almost be tempted for the British to put in 21 for them in the US and uh, USA and Commonwealth because, you know, that's fun. 14 for Japan and 8 for France and Italy, but it works on the 10 7, so a 10 10 7 4 4 ratio. Again, it's not a massive amount of ships. One of the things that often amazes students when you start to work through them and you do the sort of well, not quite to the model UN, but the negotiations of diplomacy. And you start them thinking about, right then, what do you want? What do you, are you prepared to settle with, settle for, and what will make you unhappy? The difference between all three is not that much. Does anyone go away from this treaty being 100% happy? No. Does anyone go away from this treaty feeling like they've been completely mugged off? No. That's the important thing. If they go away all feeling a sort of equal level of satisfaction and dissatisfaction. In fact, Japan would be elated. They've got they can start building stuff. Which is good. Why is it good for Japan to be building stuff? Because there are three reasons it is good. One, if they have are incentivized to build stuff which fits within the treaty. Then they will build. Uh, then they'll be happily building that rather than building stuff which doesn't fit in the treaty. Secondly, if they're building stuff, they're having to import goods from elsewhere because Japan doesn't have the infrastructure, which makes them more dependent upon global trade, which means they're even less um, keen on the issues of conflict and even more exposed to issues of economic coercion, which. I know the US does like to use on Japan at this point in various other nations, on its traditional blockade or embargo, etc. That works best when your opponent is exposed to it, not when your opponent has managed to isolate themselves from it. And finally, and this is the most important thing, if Japan is not building those things, so Japan, the most militant of all the nations involved here, is not constructing things they are allowed to. That tells you immediately those yards are being used for something else they're not supposed to. It's the most advantageous thing you can do. Now, I know you like these plans. I know you like me talking about them. So here is the rough one for the light cruisers. The rough one for the light cruisers of what you could do. And you've got 200,000 ton limit. Total tonnage in 1930, 161,390 tons in service. And that's including the Super Leanders on order, which are slightly heavier than the regular Leanders. And then I've ordered another four, which will probably be the Amphion class. And still not much going on. And if we go there, oof. This one looks like there's a lot going on. It looks like it's got up to 233,000 tons, but it's got a 40,000 ton theoretical construction allowance, so that's well within that, which is fine. Drops down again this year. That. Slightly over in the tonnage. Again, this one. Slightly over in the tonnage. But not that bad. Yeah, I need to play around. Yes, I need to um, work these things out. But this is the thing. If you've got this going on, Britain is churning out a few cruisers every single year. And that's the point. 
By the way, the Southampton should be, uh, it's supposed to be four over two lines, but it's decided to double them up. Um, this is what you could have had building. You could have had a constant flow of new light cruisers. We start off with the heavy cruisers. And the RN could have been building a couple in nineteen a couple of Surreys in nineteen thirty, and could build some Surrey pluses in nineteen thirty six. Three of them. That'd been rather nice, wouldn't it? It's not a massive construction order going on. It's not a humongous construction load going on. It's enough. That's what it's there to be. Enough. So what did it work? Well, there's an interesting option on the ratios. And that is Germany. And the Soviet Union. But there are other interesting points here. Would it have worked? Would the cruisers have worked? Well, let's go back to this. You have 200,000 tons of light cruiser. Let's say you average 8,000 tons for each one. Well, if you do, that would give you 25 light cruisers. You average 10,000 tons for the heavy cruisers, that gives you 20 heavy cruisers. That's 45 cruisers. That's not enough for British, is it? But a British to get enough from their light cruisers and their heavy cruisers, they have to average 4,000 tons. Now, yes, you can keep overage ships and service, and they can do rolls, and yes, the British will have the travel class destroyers, but they're still not going to get enough. And let's be honest, Broadly speaking, where do the British settle in terms of cruiser design? Well, for their light cruisers, roughly 8,000 tons. In standard. So that's 25. 25 light cruisers and 20 heavy cruisers. Ouch. Would they prefer to transfer 50,000 tons from the heavy cruisers to the light cruisers? Possibly. But would they be able to? No. They've been appointed as a satisfaction, but it keeps everyone honest. What would the British have done? Um, I honestly don't really know, because 4,000 tons is not going to produce a decent enough cruiser for what they need. But with some of the th things I'm throwing in a destroyer category, especially for the destroyer leader, it probably works out in the wash. Because as I've designed it at the moment, and you're going to see this in the destroyer video when that comes out, they can get easily 16 2,000 ton tribal class destroyers, which is an honest tonnage for what the tribes will be. So if you've got those 16, and if you've got 20 heavy cruisers, that's 36. Which point your light cruisers really need to provide 40, but we know, honestly, honestly, the Royal Navy, you're gonna get, you can get a part of by a few of those being overage vessels. Now, if you've got 15, yeah, 15 to 20 overage vessels, you can probably get by with your cruise, uh, light cruisers aver being sort of new ones are roughly an average of 30. Which, if you think about it, is roughly 6,600 tons on average for each ship. Which works out. You can build a decent cru light cruiser for that. So that gives you 20 over age, 30, uh, 30 in age light cruisers. 20 in age heavy cruisers, 
and 16 destroyers which can do some sort of cruiser roll if they need to. Hmm. That's roughly 86 ships which roughly co which covers the roll. Roughly. Does it cover the roll as well as 70 new ones would? Nope. But does it do the job? Probably. What about America? Well, they can build huge numbers of ships. And they can be really happy with them. Japan? Yep. They can build more heavy cruisers. They can build more light cruisers. They can build all sorts of things. 140,000 tons is a good sweet spot for them. Within their infrastructure aim, which allows them to build it, but it also allows them to build. France and Germany? And Italy? Well, let's be honest. The Weimar Republic is the odd one in this, in that it could still fall to Nazi Germany, to, to the rise of the Nazis. But it's not preordained. And if you have the economy going, if you have the bounce back from construction going on in some of those key voting districts, that could really change the way things turn out. And if they change the way things turn out, they could change the way things turn out in terms of war fighting. So it's really interesting to see. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. I try and keep these slightly shorter than 75 minutes because if they are longer than 75 minutes, YouTube gets a bit worried about me. Now, the next video to come out will be Destroyers tomorrow on the 9th of June. Then there's a gap. There's a special for the 10th of June. And then there's the 11th and 12th of June. The very uh, more treaties. And then the 13th of duty in June, US Cruise Strategy. Then the Gasana class on the 14th of June. 15th of June, Equitable London Treaties, Overable Equitable Treaties, which will is the is the long patrol which will come out because there's going to be a live on the 16th. And on the 17th, there's going to be a long patrol come out, which is going to be for the live on the 18th, which is the 18th of June. And then, of course, on the Sunday, on the Saturday, there's going to be the 18th of June event, which is going to be live. And then on the 19th of June, there is going to be a brew ship. So you're pretty much going to have had things from me every single day since... Oh my lord, you're going to have had a video come out every day from the 29th of May to the 19th of June. If you're all sick of me by the time the next... I'm guessing three weeks have passed, I will not be surprised. Hope you're enjoying the videos, hope you're finding it useful, and um, thank you for watching. And as I said, there could be a lives. Uh, we'll be trying to do lives from the ships when we're on them. Take care, have fun, and thank you for watching.